Great singing this morning. If you will, take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 today. And we're going to look at verse 14 in just a moment. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14. Good to see you today. And uh, you got a couple weeks break from me. So you came back to church today and you're at least going to give me another chance. I appreciate that. But uh, appreciate all of you who encouraged and prayed for us as we were gone. Had a good time together. Some of you noticed I got a little bit of a tan. I tanned all week. We were gotten, I'm just kidding, me and the sun. We actually don't get along real well, but uh, still some of it came through my SPF 3000 that I was wearing. And uh, so you can see a little bit of that came through today. But uh, thrilled to be back in God's house. I don't know about you, but sometimes when you go away, you enjoy your time away. But then coming home, that's just as much a treasure as going away, remembering where God has you. And uh, we do consider this home. And thrilled to be with you again this morning and excited about what God is going to do. Let's stand together if you're able to do so for a moment. Exodus chapter 20, we'll read verse 14. And ask the Lord to bless our time today as you're standing. Good to have several guests with us and trust that you've been greeted. Should have received a pamphlet in there, some information about our church. We invite you to look that over. Also in there, as well as in the pew in front of you, is a connection card. We'd ask you to fill out the front side of that card. We'd love to have a record of your visit. If you have prayer requests or things you want me to be aware of since I've been gone about certain somebody on staff or whatever, you can let me know that, but uh, turn those in today at the end of the service. We're so glad you're here. Exodus 20, let's look at verse 14. Let's go back to verse number one, just to set the context of this verse. And God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And then we've been looking at these 10 commands of God. Go down, if you will, to verse number 14. The Bible says this, thou shalt not commit adultery. And so we're working through these top 10 commands of God and then shedding light from the New Testament upon them and how they apply to us in our day. And today we want to look at this subject together, exclusive purity, exclusive purity. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for this hour that you've given to us to gather together in your name. And Lord, to allow these rich lyrics and and melodies, Lord, to uh, stir us and to elevate our focus from our uh, world and its trends and its priorities to that which is the person of God, your throne, your purpose, uh, your sovereign plan in our lives. And I pray, Father, that we would allow you to be sovereign, not just in current events, and in our culture, but to be sovereign in our bodies and in our minds and in our hearts in this area of subject matter that's before us today. And I pray, Father, you'd help me to be uh, discreet where needed, but also to be direct where needed, that, Lord, your word might speak to the culture of our day and its influences upon our hearts and our minds and our marriages, that, Lord, we would be more exclusive in our relationship with you And if, Lord, we have a spouse today, that we would put that relationship as the primary focus of our desires and our appetites. We thank you, Lord, for this blessing to be in this place today. We pray that you would help us to buy up this opportunity as we study your word. Bless the study of your word. Bless its application in our lives as we leave today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Uh, While we were on vacation, uh, we did a lot of things, went to the beach, saw the wild horses in Corolla, uh, Outer Banks, and some other really neat things, got to meet up with the Richardsons, a family in our church that had moved south. But one of the things that we enjoyed doing, or we enjoyed, and we all pretended to, some of us pretended to enjoy, was we went into a few boutique shops, you know, you always got to do that, and the boys and I try to figure out what to do while my wife's looking at things, and uh, we were... We were in a shop that had really little of, if anything, of interest to us, and so we're desperately looking for things, and so I was in the very back of the store and saw this mug that I find hilarious. You may not think this is funny, but to me, I think this is hilarious. This has to be a guy's mug, obviously, from the wording, but he says this, I need to pay closer attention to stuff, dot, dot, dot. Found out today my wife and I have different names for the cat, (laughs) different names for the same cat. Can I just say as we begin today... There's no area where we don't really define our terms and we don't speak with specificity more so than the area that we're going to today. Can I just say as we begin today that you and I must be honest enough to realize that in this area, not only are we not talking, we are isolated, we are disconnected where we need to be more connected with God, His truth as it applies in this area. And I was reading an article that kind of shaped some of the study and the concepts that uh, we'll look at today. 
An author said this, sex and marriage are two of God's greatest gifts. No relationship can be as intimate, sweet, life-giving, and joy-filled as the marital relationship And no experience can be as intimate and powerful within that marriage relationship as marital intimacy. So, of course, the devil is going to go after it uh, with all that he has. We should expect confusion, misunderstanding, perversion, and pain. Not because they were designed to be bad things and not worth the effort, but precisely because they are such good gifts. God's best gifts are the ones most apt to be twisted and perverted by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so what I'm doing today and what our church is committed to doing is pushing back against those distortions and saying God has created this. God uh, wants to redeem it where maybe it has fallen uh, into an area that God would not desire. And I use this graphic today of an island, and the idea in, in your heart and mind should be that there ought to be some exclusive levels of intimacy that we share only with God, And there ought to be some exclusive levels of intimacy we only share with our God-given spouse. And if you don't have one today uh, or have not uh, had one yet, uh, this may be something eventually that applies to you in that area. But I was reading, and an author said this, if everything is important, then nothing is important. And could we not substitute in there, if everyone is important, then no one is important. Uh, So there needs to be a level of importance put on marriage that I think has fallen in our day on hard times. The question today is, in a world that justifies deviant behavior and excuses extramarital interactions, how do we practice purity that is committed to the Lord, first of all, and secondly, to the spouse that he may have given to us? Let's talk about today two commitments to intimate purity that a law-abiding believer strives to possess. Number one, first of all, let's talk about for a few minutes purity of our choices. Purity of our choices. If you look here in Exodus chapter 20, you will notice that it says in verse 14, thou shalt not. And the idea is that it is a choice. Our purity or lack thereof is a result of our choices. Um, The other day I heard someone say this in reference to choices in a more general sense. They said this, quote, everything happens for a reason. Sometimes that reason is you're stupid and you make bad choices. That's the reason for what's going on in your life. And I'll be honest with you, in this area as well as others, we tend to abdicate responsibility. Uh, We blame the spouse that's not everything that we think they should be, or we blame our culture, or we blame so-and-so. And can I say some of the wounds in this room, in this category, are the result of poor choices of others? I'll concede that today. But you and I must possess our own vessel. Do we not have to? We work out our salvation. We, we progressively are sanctified, less like the world and more like our Savior. And so it is a matter of choices, making purity a choice uh, that we are willing to make. May I give you today in James chapter 1, would you go there? We're going to look at a couple of New Testament passages, first in James and then in Matthew 5, that weigh upon this, weigh in upon this, or give to us some New Testament perspective through the lips of the Apostle Uh, James as well as Jesus in just a moment. But go if you will to James chapter 1. And let's look at a couple of things that we can do in this area of purity to be more exclusive toward our spouse and toward our Savior and our Lord uh, that involve choices. James chapter 1, and let's begin in verse number 13. James 1, and let's begin in verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Number one, first of all, you and I, if we're going to choose purity that's exclusive in God's sight, number one, we have to own where we are making lustful choices, Uh, where we are making wrong choices. We must own that where we are responsible in order to turn the corner toward God's ideal of purity. Own your lustful choices. It may give you two things found in these first few verses of this text this morning that we have to do if we're to own uh, where we are making poor decisions, uh, decisions that are dictated and driven by our carnal lust. Number one, jot this down, not on the slide, but in your notes there, two lustful choices to subtract. Number one, blaming God. We must admit where we are blaming God for we are where we are not being what we should be in this area of purity. And you notice in verse 13 that James says, let no man say, here's, here's the blame, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he 
any man. James rebukes those trying to blame God where they are caving to temptation. God cannot be tempted, and neither does he tempt any man. He is not behind the temptations you face in this area. Don't use him as an excuse. Verse 14, but every man, here's what honestly is actually happening. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his, what's the next word? Own lust and enticed. And so it is, it is our personal responsibility is not the God that we are tempted to blame. The source of temptation is within a person. It's the result of evil desires and lust and inner cravings. And we, it's almost the language here is the idea that we bait our own hook and then we swallow the hook. That's the language there. And, and we bite it and we swallow it and we suffer the consequences. To change in this area, we must acknowledge our personal responsibility. Just a takeaway today. If you notice in this area of our morality, and I would say our immorality in our day, that there's an abdication of responsibility, and here's the language I hear all the time, I was born this way, I, want, I just want this, I, just, I love in this way, I express myself in this way. Who ultimately are you blaming when you say that? God, who made you. God, who's trying to redeem you. And so may we be careful to not blame God where we are not uh, being honest and faithful in this area of purity. All right, verse 15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Number two, so two lustful choices to subtract. Stop blaming God. Number two, jot this down, ignoring the consequences. Ignoring the consequences. Um. In our society today, if you were to list the top five worst sins of our world, would adultery be in them? I would say no. If you ask the average person on the street, if you ask the average even believer, I think if we're honest, it's often not as, as far up the list as probably God would have it. In fact, our society would say that adultery is a, quote, victimless crime. Uh, it used to be illegal. It's no longer considered illegal. It used to be something that could bring down consequences. And for some reason, we believe we can do it. We can participate in or excuse in the lives of others, and there will be no consequences. Can I give you a quick sobering example that almost shocks me as I read the subtext of it today in the thinking of our culture? A lady named Judith Brandt wrote a book called The 50-Mile Rule, Your Guide to Infidelity and Extramarital Etiquette, and this was in 1999. Recently, a book published by Cameron Barnes called this, Affair, How to Manage Every Aspect of Your Extramarital Relationship with Passion, Discretion, and Dignity. The publisher described it as, quote, a thoughtful, detailed discussion of every aspect of considering, preparing for, beginning and conducting a successful and emotionally fulfilling extramarital affair. It's so in your face. That's our culture. And so we must fight against that and resist that by remembering the consequences that come when we don't do it God's way. And you notice the language in verse 15, for those of you that are maybe tempted to flirt with sin or lust in this area, notice he says, then when lust hath conceived, notice the strong language here, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. It uses a biological imagery here that is vivid, this lust conceives, and in the conception of sin when it is born, when it is birthed. This grotesque child of sin as it matures, it produces offspring and death here and death here and separation here. There are consequences to violating God's instructions as it pertains to this commandment. A verse you could write down and read on your own time, Hebrews 13 and verse 5, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. We are not undercutting marriage in any way today. It's a sacred, it's a special thing within the gardens of marriage. But the end of the verse says, whoremongers and adulterers, adulterers, God will judge. That's, a, that's still in the Bible, isn't it? And so we must acknowledge those consequences. By the way, I've said this before. Why does God give us warnings in Scripture? Because He can't wait to give, it, give those warnings to be brought to fruition in our life, or are they preventative in nature? Hebrews 13.5 is not to ruin marriage or to box us in where we want to be just a free spirit or a free body. It's to protect us from the consequences that are a part of uh, violating God's law. At some point, our purity or lack thereof is really about our relationship with the one true God, is it not? It really isn't about the other person or the activity. It's about our God and our view of Him. 
But today you have two choices. You can fashion a false god graven in the image of your ideal sensuality or whatever your specific uh, appetite, or you can worship the one true God. But at some point you have to choose. Every young man, every senior man, every young lady and, and, and aged lady, all of us must choose whether we worship sensuality and sexuality or we worship the one true God. God puts us in that moment of crisis. All right, go on to verse 17. Let's look now at the positive side of God's provision as it relates to thou shalt not commit adultery in our choices. Look at verse 17. I love this. I don't know if you've noticed this transition. I hear people quote verse 17 without considering the verses that precede it. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, uh, neither shadow of turning. Number two, secondly, we need not only own our lustful choices, we need to secondly own our sanctified choices. Own your own personal sanctification. Um, you can excuse your background and how you were treated or mistreated as a child, uh, previous relationships you have been in, your current dysfunctional, maybe you would describe it as such, marriage, whatever the specifics, maybe you live in isolation, but honoring God, it's something we must own. If you remember the Cuyahoga River back in the 60s? If you remember the stories out of Cleveland, the, the beginning of the 1900s, and then even in the middle, I don't remember them, but I've read of them. Um, and it was interesting, uh, the fires, have you ever read of the fires where literally they had dumped all kinds of waste and not just human waste, but industrial waste into that river for years and decades. And it was so combustible, you not only didn't want to swim in it, you didn't want to light a match within a mile of it. It just, it would catch on fire. And there was an article in the news just a few weeks ago that it's been now, 1969 was the last fire that was, uh, what was that, 50 years ago? And they were commemorating, it's been 50 years since the last fire of the Cuyahoga River, and they were tracking how much the water has been cleansed. They said, technically, you can eat fish out of the river. I don't know that I still would do so, but they made decisions to change this and improve this and stop dumping this into that uh, that body of water. And those choices over the years have gained traction. They've, they've brought purity where there was not purity. They've brought life where there was no life. And the same can be true of you today. Maybe you are prone and weak in this area. God can change your life if you'll make the choices of sanctification that God invites you into. And you notice a change in mindset. Verses 13 through 16 are very deflecting. They're very irresponsible. But then in verse 17, here's how we should think. Here's how we should view God. Here's how we should view our lives and our relationship before Him. I may give you two sanctified choices to add to your relationship before God and your relationship if God has blessed you with such a spouse. Two sanctified choices. Number one, jot this down, trusting God. Choose to trust in God. Not only are God's gifts good, as you see referenced there in the beginning of verse 17, they're useful, they're practical, they're, they're perfect, but they're also, notice he says, they're consistent without variableness, neither shadow of turning. A person who fails this commandment is often characterized by fickleness. They're always changing and what's new and what, what, what's new and uh, titillating that I can reach out to that will appeal to me and satisfy me and thrill me in some way. And the answer to our fickleness that trips us up in this area is to, to have relationship with and to reflect upon the faithfulness of God. And just this thought today, what is our status as the church of Jesus Christ? We are the what of Christ. We are his what? His bride. If anybody had an excuse to move on from a, from a bride, it's, it's God. We failed him over and over and over. And what is he? Every day he is what? He is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. And as we reflect upon that in our lives, how faithful he is to us with all of our shortcomings, the least we can be is be faithful to him. And if he's given us a flawed but a person from God in our home, we are to be faithful to them. Be faithful not because someone deserves it or you feel like it, because you but because you trust in a God who is faithful. All right, verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature. Second, number two, jot this down, not only a sanctified choice of trusting God, number two, obeying God. Obeying God. 
I don't know if you knew it or not, but in our church, we have some celebrities. Did you hear about this? Some, one of our families made the newspaper. Did you hear about this? The Carney family, all three of their kids uh, were in the newspaper, right, Rachel, last week or while we were gone anyway. And I was talking to Brother Josh about um, that incident, and he was trying to explain to his kids the, the monumental occasion that it was. And the question out of George, I think their oldest was, what's a newspaper? He, he asked his dad, what is a newspaper? And, and so Josh had to break down what a newspaper is and why weird people still read them when it's all online or whatever. What's a newspaper? Can I just tell you when it relates to our purity, there's a book God has given us, a manuscript that will never change. And it requires of us faith, yes, but also obedience. I think sometimes we give a head affirmation or, yes, I acknowledge the Bible, but I live in the real world. It's not just about trusting in the Bible or trusting what God has said. It's about obeying it, doing this idea of sanctification, choosing to do what God has said, choosing to not do what God has said not to do. The solution for temptation is found in a close relationship with God and a constant response to His Word. Just a thought today, wherever you struggle, men, if it's pornography or the, the kind of sancti- the sanitized versions of that, ladies, whatever as you read or meditate upon, young people, wherever you're finding that pull, a person who is obeying God's word will not fail in this area. It's as much about what you're doing as what you're not doing. Choose to do God's word, choose to follow his will, and that will will possess you and control you and direct you away from these temptations. Psalm 119, verses 9 and 11, the psalmist says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed there according to thy word. Verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Who were those words penned by? Very likely they were penned by a man named David, right? What was he guilty of toward the twilight moments of his life? He committed what? Adultery and then compounded that with murder. I would just caution those in the room who think this is a subject for the young people. Much of the adultery from God's perspective being committed is not being committed by those young, immature people. Much of the consumption of pornography and a lot of these issues we're dealing with happen later in life when we become kind of soft and open to things we used to not be soft and open toward. And so may God help us and guard us against that as we move through life to keep ourselves obeying God's word faithfully. You cut one corner and it leads to another. Stay faithful where God has called you. Now the verb, notice this, the verb in verse 18 where he says, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. The word begat there is from the same word back in verse 15 that says, bringeth forth sin. So you want to do your adultery thing? Here's what happens. It brings forth death. You choose to possess your vessel and to choose to obey God, it, it brings forth this fruitfulness. He begat us with the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. The choice is yours. The fruit, the consequences of it are not. And may I say today, you're as far from adultery today as you want to be and as close to God today as you want to be, period. No excuses. Purity motivated by anything other than trust and obedience toward God is unsustainable. It's not just no, 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 no. It's yes, God, I trust you. Yes, I obey you. I honor you in this area. Help me to stay pure and exclusive in my relationship with you. If you read books, I, would, I want to give you a book. You can jot this down. It's not a perfect book, but the name of the book is Sacred Marriage. It's a book I use regularly in my counseling. And the premise of the book is this. Marriage is not for our happiness. Marriage is for our holiness. And the whole book unpacks that. It's a profound book, a great book. I love as I work through it with young couples and aged couples that they uh, grow in their understanding of God's purpose for marriage. But in that book, Gary Thomas says this, to begin to view sex in this positive sense, a mirror of our desire and passion for God, the institution of marriage becomes all important. Listen to this statement. Our restlessness for immoral experiences mirrors our restlessness for God. And therefore, the ability to use this as a spiritual aid may begin to make more sense and help us in our relationship with the Lord. Our restlessness. What does our culture crave and promote and push over and over? It's in this area. And the reason is because we need God. We long for God. And this is often the way we seek to dull that. All right, number two. Look back at the text, if you will, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. Notice he says this. 
Thou shalt not. So there's a shall. It's a, it's a choice that we make. Notice he says this at the end of verse 14. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Number two, not only is purity a matter of choice, number two, it's a matter of commitment. When someone is engaged in an immoral act or thought or moment, there's an all-in kind of commitment that's a part of that. We lose ourselves in that moment. And the same is true of our sanctification. Um, any of you big royal, like the royal family of England, you follow them, you track them every marriage, you stay up late to watch or get up early, whichever it is, to watch the marriage. Any of you royal people, lovers out there? A few of you are closet ones, you're not willing to acknowledge it. Um, but the, the other day I saw this picture. I don't know if you saw this or not. This picture was taken in 2015. And it's a photo of Queen Elizabeth, this would have been just a few years ago, smiling uh, to a prank being played by her husband that went viral back in 2015. The photo shows Prince Philip, her husband, pretending to be a royal guard to the delight of the queen. You never see her have this kind of expression, barely. In the photo, Prince Philip is standing in attention while wearing his full military suit and the iconic bearskin fur hat, similar to the ones worn by the queen's guard. And the, the emphasis that came out of that was it shows how the two have kept their sanity and kept their commitment to their marriage. They've been married for over 70 years, longest married monarchs in English history. And they, they found a way to make it work. They found a way to stay committed to one another with all the unique aspects and challenges of their relationship. Here's just my thought today. The reason we are moving into this area more and more so, we tolerate more and more, is because we're not willing to commit we want one-night tryst. We want, we want random brushes and contacts with people and things and experiences, but we don't want to commit to one person. We want to commit to one God. We don't want to commit to one church and the, one family, etc. The list goes on and on. Purity comes through commitment just as adultery trips us up. Let's go to Matthew 5, would you? And let's spend a few minutes here looking at ways that we can possess our vessel and practice purity by being more committed to the Lord. Matthew chapter 5. And let's spend a few minutes beginning in verse 28. Matthew chapter 5, and let's look, if you will, at verse 28. Uh, let's pick, actually begin in verse 27. Matthew chapter 5, and let's begin in verse 27. <clears throat> you have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Number one, first of all, you and I, number one, need to be willing to own our internal commitments. Own what is our internal commitments. Uh, Brother Caleb today uh, taught our Sunday school lesson on discipline. And just in case I forget to say it, next Sunday night he will be his last service here. He's out with our kids today um, in junior church, but he'll be preaching for us that Sunday night. We're having a fellowship for him afterwards. And we'd love to give him something as far as a love offering for his service as an intern. Just a mental note of that. But he was teaching today on uh, discipline, and specifically discipline nobody sees. Uh, we need to own our internal commitments. Um, when you think of adultery, when you hear that word, what do you think of? Is it more external in its frame of reference, or is it more internal? I'll be honest with you, I tend to, even, I just studied this, I've been working on this for today, I still tend to go toward external actions, um, interactions, etc., as opposed to the internal, obviously, is the focus of God and of Christ in the text that we're looking at right now. And so despite its associations, adultery has so little to do with the external body and its actions and its activities and its interactions, and it has much to, more to do with the internal heart-level issues between us and our God. All right, let's talk about two internal commitments that we need to subtract. So let's talk about things that need to be eradicated or eliminated from our hearts and from us inside in our guts that will help us be more what God wants. Jot these down. Number one, others' standards. Others' standards. We need to subtract from our mind and our heart where we have drawn lines or standards that have been established by others. And you look there at verse 27, he says, you have heard that it was said by them. Of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. The Pharisees, <coughs> excuse me, would have focused on the, out, the act itself. And as long as someone was not participating in the outward act, they were compliant with this law. Whereas Jesus Christ obviously brings it 
more on the inside. Here's how culture works when it comes to standards in this area. We start out as a culture, as our country did, with liberties. We have all these things that God has blessed us with, and we enjoy those liberties, and we experience those liberties, and then we begin to misuse and abuse those liberties, and slowly we see things begin to digress, and what do we do? Instead of confronting it, we dumb down, or we lower the bar of what's deviant, or what is acceptable, and we keep adjusting that. And those standards, listen to me, are in this room. We're allowing the world to say what's in bounds and what is not in bounds. And we need to reject that and say, God, what is your standard? What do you expect? Help me to be a part of your purpose and plan. Um, just an example of that. The American Psychological Association, I'm not a huge fan of them, uh, probably will be revealed as I read this article, is bringing back what they call uh, polyamory. Poly would be many. Amory, uh, amour is love. Um, a fancy word for sleeping around with lots of people and normalizing people having relationship with multiple partners. Their latest effort is to get rid of the stigma, they call it, of consensual non-monogamy, which is just gibberish for adultery, obviously. And they go on to talk about different expressions of this. They want to be normal. One of them they described as relationship anarchy. Well, that, yeah, that's what we need in our culture, isn't it? That's what our kids need, a bunch of selfish adults doing whatever they want. Uh, and they're pushing that and promoting that. And the article I was reading said there's a problem here is there's no such thing as ethical, non-monogamous relationship. That doesn't exist from God's perspective. Every form of expression outside of the union of one man and one woman in marriage is unethical, immoral, and culturally corrosive. That's the truth. That's what God wants to be said. That's what God wants to be heard and applied. And so we need to be willing to yield to God's standard, not the changing, morphing standards of our culture. Uh, this would include living together without being married, homosexuality, pornography, the list goes on and on. They are wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong, no matter what everybody else says or everybody else thinks. Someone the other day said this, the reason we have 17,000 pages in our law books is because we cannot follow 10 lines on a tablet made of stone. That's our issue. And we're trying to hem each other in and box. When we, if we just do what God said, abandon those standards. Let God's standard be our guide. All right, number two, go to verse 28. So you heard this, verse 28, but I, Christ says, say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery, there's that word, with her already in his heart. Number two, jot this down. Now we need to reject the Commitment of other commitments to other standards. Number two, your fantasies. We need to reject and subtract from our lives a commitment to our own fantasies. There was an article I was reading that was describing an interview. It was an interview between the founder of an online service targeted at monetizing adulterous hookups, and he said this. He has a website with 3.1 subscribe 3.3 uh, million subscribers. He said he started thinking about the service after reading that 30% of people signing up for single dating services were currently married. 30%. And I think that number holds from other studies that I've read since. We can, we can think and pretend it's not a part of our culture, not a part of people we know, but it is. It may be virtual, it may be, quote, safe and sanitized, but it's still there. Those fantasies, those wanderings of minds and hearts that God truly cares about. Now, I might just say this to qualify verse 28. Noticing that someone of the opposite gender or someone that you, you notice in your world, that they're uh, attractive or handsome is not necessarily in and of itself wrong. That's not what's being referenced here. That, that woman is a beautiful woman. That man is a handsome man. That's not what we're talking about. The sin is when that noticing becomes this word that's described here, when the recognition becomes a desire, a coveting of, a lingering upon, a lustful look. And so we see Christ obviously saying the act is wrong, but also the attitude of the heart is just as equally important from God's perspective. May I be blunt this morning, even if we don't commit the physical act with our body, we can still be guilty of adultery by means of our thoughts, our fantasies, our readings, our clickings, and our affections. Just thinking about it from Christ's perspective means it is wrong. Are we not often guilty of this command? The lustful look, by the way, has the idea, a heart attitude that says, if I, if I could, I would. That's kind of the idea. And if you think long enough in that way, you eventually will act upon that and dishonor the Lord. 
Matthew 15, 19, you could jot it down. It says this, for out of the heart, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, here it is, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. Those things come out of the heart. So guard the heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now, as you consider Christ's words there, I don't like verse 28. I'll be honest with you. And I don't like the previous one where Christ talked about anger. It's the same as murder. It seems to rub us the wrong way. It seems to be counter our intuitiveness. But clearly the seventh commandment has a broad range of convicting applications. And I would submit to you today, because of the language of verse 28, there's not an adult in this room who is not guilty of violating the seventh command. It's something we must guard against. It's something we must ask for God's cleansing and forgiveness and transformation that we might honor and please him. All right, let's look now at the positive side of the coin, if you will, beginning in verse 29. doesn't start out real positive, but we'll get there. Look at verse 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Number two, secondly, own not only your um, internal commitments, number two, own your radical commitments. Be willing to do whatever it takes to change in this area. Last night, we, uh, the home that we live in now is, is uh, on 250 going toward Ashland, right on the county line of Ashland and Wayne County, and uh, there's an ice cream shop that seems a whole lot closer when you drive to it than when you bike to it. And we found out that fact last night. Uh, so we got our bikes out, oiled the chains. We hadn't ridden our bikes for a while, made sure the tires at least were full when we started. And so we launch out, and it seemed like it was forever. Now, we had ice cream waiting on the other end of the, the trip there, but it was the way back where it's like, this is the, this, you know, I mean, just what were we thinking, you know? And you, you kind of regret the commitment. And it's a, there's a point of no return, right? At least one of us has to get back to that their house so we can get back there, you know. And so we're going through this whole thing of we made a commitment and then we got to follow through on it. And by the way, they serve hard dipped ice cream, you know, this soft serve stuff, you bunch of weak city folk. But anyway, they had, they had hard dipped ice cream and I ate a big old thing of butter pecan ice cream, you know, and then, then jump back on your bike and here we go. And it, it's, it literally felt like 40 miles. It wasn't quite that, but it felt like that going back. This commitment that we had made, follow through on it. The other day I heard someone say this commitment means staying loyal to what you said you would do long after the mood has left you. And is that not applicable to our marriages? Um, you know, our moods shift and change. Our, our, our emotions are always up and down, and they're a moving target at best. Own a radical commitment. Be willing to do what you said you would do, and do it well in this area for God's glory and honor. I say this all the time in my premarital counseling especially, but other settings as well. I believe marital intimacy is one of the greatest barometers of the health of a relationship. Um, it's not the end, it's a gauge. And if something is off in that area, there are other areas that need to change drastically for the commitment to be what it should be in that marital relationship. And so own your radical commitments. And as you do so, this area will flourish. All right, let me give you two radical commitments to add. Do you jot these down that are found in verses 29 and following? Number one, these are things that will help you if you find yourself slipping into violating this command regularly. Two radical commitments to add. Number one, jot this down, deep change. Add to your life deep changes. To the man who blames the sin on his eye or his hand, Jesus shows the logical procedure to follow. And just as we would amputate a diseased organ of our body, there's gangrene in a certain extremity of my body. The only way to move forward is to, 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 to radically amputate, to cut off that which will hinder and hurt the rest of the body. And so he says, basically the language is you need to say to that area, I divorce you, I separate myself from you, from that influence. Maybe it's a person, maybe it's a place, maybe it's access to something that needs, you know what, I, I need to cut this off, I need to deal with this in a radical way. We'll get to it at the end, but a lot of you know how you back yourself into violating this command. You start with this, and then it leads to this, and there's this backing into, and then you pretend like you're shocked that you failed in this area. 
Deal with that first area. Deal with that first sidebar. Deal with that first uh, exit that you take that leads you down this path of violating the command. Deep changes. Christ was after the heart. He wasn't after the body. He wasn't after the act in and of itself. He was after the heart of those who had wandered from him. Quick example I would give you would be Job. Remember Job chapter 1 and verse 1, where the Bible describes Job, and then later God himself says these words. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed or hated evil. Job was the ideal. He was the one de- the devil came after, and if he could knock out Job, then he would bring God's name down in the process. But later in Job 31 and verse 1, Job makes a statement. It's just kind of tucked in amongst a bunch of dialogue. He says this, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a mate? Job was righteous because he chose to be righteous. He chose a lifestyle. He chose a priority. He chose the influences around him. And he was righteous because he chose to be. Yes, God had to do a work in him, but there was a choice that he made. And if you and I are not pure before God, it's because we're choosing to not be. It's, we're choosing to not change where God wants to bring change. Men and women of moral integrity don't just happen. They progressively change with deep commitments to purity inspired by the same Jesus, listen to me, who did not condemn the adulterous woman but forgave her. And God wants to do that in your life. We're not today trying to judge you or bring you into condemnation just for condemnation's sake, but to bring you to a place of need and recognition of that need to change. Just the other day, someone was talking about lifting of hands. When I lift my hands, if I don't say anything, what does that convey to you? When you see me go like this, maybe touchdown, let's not go there today, okay? We're in church. (laughs) But what kind of bigger kind of things come to your mind? Two things. Uh, One would be, the author said this, victory... And number two, if we throw our hands up, what are we saying? We what? We surrender. We surrender to that change. We surrender to what God wants to do in our lives. Are you willing to change? Don't make the excuse any longer. Let God change you. All right, number two, go to verse 31. And it's amazing how this flows. Verse 31, it hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. There's that word again. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Number two, jot this down. A second radical commitment that we need to add. Number one, deep change. Number two, jot this down. Abiding covenant. Abiding covenant. Now, just to give you a little context, when they would have heard that verse, those words that Jesus just said that we read in verses 31 and 32, it was the normal custom of that day for a man to be able to just verbally divorce their wife. Obviously, ladies in that setting did not have the same legal rights as they do today. And the Arab custom was to simply say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. They would say it three times. And the divorce was done. There was no further legal uh, uh, obligation on the man's part or the woman's part. That, that uh, relationship had been uh, uh, dissolved. In contrast, the ancient law of Israel insisted on a writing of divorce, a certificate of divorce. This would provide legal protection for the man. It would provide uh, protection for the woman. And there was this thinking that this is something that possibly could be entered into lightly. Uh, And so Christ is confronting that. And let's look quickly at chapter 19. We're in Matthew 5. Go to 19 of Matthew for just a moment. And this it'll come back, stick with me here, on this idea of divorce uh, in a light view of the marital relationship versus uh, a reverent, sanctified view. Matthew 19, let's begin in verse 3. So this conversation comes back uh, between the Pharisees and Jesus Christ. And notice what they say in verse 3. And they're just trying to trap him. They're not necessarily after the answer. The Pharisees also came unto him, Matthew 19, 3, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Notice these next three words, for every cause, um, for any reason. Verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. There's a union there. Verse 6, Wherefore they are no more twain, or two, but one flesh. What therefore, and you've probably heard this at most weddings, God had joined together, let no man put asunder. Notice now verse 7. They say to him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement to put her away? 
And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth, notice the word, adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Now, we do not have the time to look at all of that text. My point in reading it is this. A light view of marriage leads to committing adultery. When it's for any cause, it's irreconcilable difference. And again, there are grounds for divorce, and even these texts reference it. Divorce is not a sin in and of itself, but how we steward it and how we steward our marriage relationship uh, is a moral issue. And so we see to treat marriage lightly, to abandon it for every cause, is to be as much an adulterer as the most extreme hedonist type of person we could think of. Just treating marriage lightly uh, can find us in those ranks. We read in our Sunday school uh, today, Brother Ray Dank, who's our missionary to Germany. Did you catch that? I thought that was interesting. That was in our newsletter today. His parents celebrated their 40th anniversary, and in the newsletter it had a picture of him officiating their renewal of vows. Bob, who is the son, was helping them celebrate their 40th anniversary by um, renewing their vows. But what was interesting, he said they have done that since marriage every five years. So some of us guys are really in the doghouse right now, okay, because I know that's ultimately probably on us. But every five years, they've renewed their vows. Year five, year 10, year 15, all the way now to 40 years. I think that's awesome. I think it's a great idea. It's a, it's a renewal of commitment. It's not treating it lightly. It's treating it as something weighty, something significant. How do you treat your marriage if you have one today? And you realize that it's about a covenant. It's about a commitment. And to not do so just sets your up, yourself up for failure uh, in this area. Sobering application today, apathy and boredom, not unrestrained, distorted passions are the most common setup to adultery. It's not the person pursuing the most hedonistic kind of things. It's the person just bored. It's the person just apathetic toward God and toward the spouse he has given to them. That's what leads down this path of failure morally. Do not regularly express and embody commitment to your spouse in this area and lead your mind and heart to start wandering toward, as the Bible says over and over, strange flesh. I've said this before. I'll say it again just briefly. You ever amazed at a man who will leave his wife objectively for a woman who is not as attractive as his wife? You know why? Because it's different. It's strange. It's just something exotic. It's something different. And we do the same with God. We wander from God just to find something new. May God guard us against that as we stay in covenant relationship. All right, let's end today in Matthew 5. Would you go back there for just a moment and let's look at verse number 8. Say, Pastor, what's this all about? This principle of thou shalt not commit adultery. Why does God require that of us? Why didn't he let us loose where we can just do what we want in this area? Matthew chapter 5 and just a moment read verse number 8. Before we do that, I wanted to show you a picture. Um, we were obviously at the beach some and ate some seafood and things, but I saw this, this story before we left. This is a picture of a guy who works for the, uh, near Niagara Falls for the water conservation uh, department there in that region. And what he's holding, believe it or not, is a goldfish. That's a goldfish, okay? And the caption of the uh, picture they had on their Facebook page read as follows, why you should never flush your fish. Uh, the Buffalo Niagara water keeper said the fish was caught uh, just downstream of their waste treatment plant. Goldfish, quote, can survive year-round in our watershed and can destroy the habitat of natural fish or native fish. According to scientists, there are tens of millions, I didn't know this till this story, tens of millions of goldfish living in the Great Lakes. Just last year, CTV uh, News reported that there are an estimated 50 million goldfish just in Lake Ontario. And he ended with this, if you cannot keep your pet, please return it to the store instead of flushing or releasing it. Just a thought today, with that kind of picture in your mind. I think we have this mindset in this area. We do whatever we want, and then we just flush away the consequences. Everything goes somewhere. Everything goes somewhere and then produces something. And what's happening is these sins and these violations of God's law are coming back to roost for us. We're seeing the byproduct. And ever, I could go through a list of social issues we have that are connected to violating this command. You can't just flush it. You can't just ignore it and pretend the consequences will not come. Now, with that being said, 
Let's zoom back out for a moment to the spiritual implications of purity. Go to verse 8 here in Matthew 5. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ says this. Notice, blessed are the pure in heart. Notice this promise, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You may get away with whatever you're doing or whatever you're tempted to do, but you will not get away with it in the face and light of God, your relationship with God. You cannot know God to the level you can when you're pursuing purity, not perfection, but purity. You're pursuing it for God's glory and honor. See, the promise for the pure is nothing less than God himself. We're not just saying you'll be more moral and life will work out for you and you'll be more healthy, wealthy, and wise. We're saying you get to know God in a way you otherwise will not. You click on those things late at night, God and you are not at the same level you would be the next morning. Uh, You read that, you talk about that, you dwell upon that, you engage in that. It hinders your relationship with God. Just this thought today, God is everywhere, right? He's in every moment. He's He's right there. He sees what you did this past weekend. He knows where you're at with your heart and mind. And that's the most encouraging thing, but it's also one of the most sobering things. God knows you today. And God requires of us purity to see him fully. Do you want to see God enough to abandon those pursuits? All right, let me give you three ways to keep the seventh commandment better. Can I give you these? These are practical today. Thoughts that God is using in my life that may help you as a man, as a woman, as a young person today. Three ways to keep the seventh commandment more effectively. Jot these three thoughts down, would you? Number one, identify and protect against the well-worn path and pattern of your lust. Identify and protect against the well-worn path and pattern of your lust. You know how you back into something. It starts with a little conversation, a certain direction that leads to another. And and, and so identify that path that leads you to moral failure. Maybe it's interaction with a certain person or being in a certain setting or listening to a certain type of music or whatever the specific that sets you up for failure. Identify it and protect against the well-worn path and pattern of your lust. All right, number two, jot this down. And this would be primarily for our men today, but I'm sure the ladies, it has application as well. Practice the, th- the three-second rule with your eyes and your mind. And this would be to help our men, especially be in compliance with Matthew 5, 28. Practice the three-second rule with your eyes and mind. Here's how it works. I see something that's tempting. Secondly, it's now in my mind. And by three, I've, I've taken it out of my mind. I see it. I have a choice what I'm going to do with it, and I move forward by three. One, two, three. Temptation is not sin, especially in our culture. It's everywhere, isn't it, men? Let's be honest. It's everywhere. Uh, And so we have to guard against it, and I found that to be very helpful. I see it. I didn't choose to see it, but it's there. Secondly, now it's in my mind and heart. What am I going to do with it? I move on. I move from that to what will honor and please the Lord. And Job 31.1 and other verses like it are some of the best things to get you from second two to second three uh, that will protect you in that. So practice the three-second rule. Any longer than that, and uh, you are probably in violation of Christ's command. All right, thirdly, jot this down. This would be a positive one. Invest in your spouse. Invest in your spouse and or the Lord. Invest in your spouse and or the Lord with emotional, spiritual, and physical commitment. Invest in your spouse and or the Lord. If you have a spouse and you have the Lord, then both. If just the Lord, that's fine. Invest in your spouse and or the Lord with emotional, spiritual, and physical commitment. Boredom, apathy, just kind of coasting is what sets up most people for violation of this command. Be committed, be engaged in the relationships you do have. Allow that to guard you, to provide that structure you need to stay on the path God has. Um, I was reading an article the other day as we finished today. The author said this, Remember, every hunger that entices us in in the flesh is an exploitation of a need that can be better met by God. Isn't that a good statement? Remember, every hunger that entices us in the flesh is an exploitation of a need that can be better, better met by God. The only context for marital intimacy is in marriage. Anything illicit is spiritual junk food, immediately sweet, but something that will poison our spiritual appetite until we crave for that which will ultimately destroy us. Illicit relationship will do nothing but diminish our sensitivity to God's holiness, His righteousness, and His presence in our lives. The apathy in our day, a lot of it has to do with this area we're failing. 
We're not standing up against it. We're not standing for it. We're not modeling it to the next generation. The question today as we finish is this. Will you honor the Lord with exclusiveness that involves chosen purity? You're as pure today as you choose to be. You're as pure today as you choose to be. And number two, will you engage in being more committed to purity in your life? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today.